Hi everyone, welcome and Om Shanti to the next normal in collaboration with America Meditating Radio. I'm your host, Sister Jenna, and it always delights me when we can take this time together to find a way to figure ourselves out. You know, it fascinates me that I spend 24 hours a day with myself, seven days a week, <laughs> and I'm still missing so much about who I am and who I will become. And I'm sure that many of you feel the same. The journey has been one of like this, no? Sometimes it feels like this, sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's like that. But it's the journey. We all have to take it, whether we like it or not. We make certain choices and we're not quite sure that um, the consequence of that choice leads us into this rabbit hole in which we get so disconnected from ourselves. And I've often seen, you know, with the attitude of addiction or sometimes when we get so caught up into something that we can't find the courage or the strength to pull back. It is such a powerful signal how deeply entrenched my spiritual capacity and power is. You know, we have, of course, our little mascot, Happy, the Havanese, who is just the bright light of the studio. And there's a little treat that Happy runs after. And she knows what draw that, that treat is in. And she will go to the draw and wait and have yoga on that draw until we go and get her a treat. And I look at her over and over again. Her addiction is so natural and it gives her so much joy. And when she finishes getting her treat, she becomes grumpy like this. And she doesn't talk to anybody in the house. She doesn't come up to any of us. She doesn't rub. She doesn't, you know, do her cute things. She's like, my treat is done. Now nothing. That's what happens, you know. We can either get addicted to a person, an idea, a thing, maybe even alcohol, drugs, whatever it might be. But it takes you over and it, you feel it's giving you joy. But something inside of you wakes up and says, I don't feel good anymore. I don't think this is me. My special guest today is Veronica Valley. She's a trained psychotherapist and sobriety expert. She has lived and taught sober living principles for over 20 years, both in her personal journey and to thousands of clients who she's helped discover the joys of sober living. She's built a community of over 10,000 and host a popular podcast with Chip Summers, the initial recovery coach, to Russell Brand, her new book, Sober Full, Uncover a Sustainable, Fulfilling Life Without Alcohol, was recently released. Today, I welcome Valerie on air. Valerie, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. What a journey it is when somehow your part, your destiny, your role takes you down a road where you've lost complete control of yourself. Yeah, it's actually Veronica, and I'll tell you, everybody Sorry. does that. It's okay, everyone does that. I, I, it took me a long while to realize that Veronica, when people hear Veronica Valley, they hear Valerie. So it's like my so good. I don't name. feel bad, I don't feel bad. <laughs> I don't feel bad about it. So Veronica, my dear, tell me about your journey. The topic of sobriety is a personal for you because you've gone through the mm. challenging times of drinking. Can you give us an overview of sure. what life was like and you know, what happened? You know, it's, it's interesting because I was obviously researching you before um, I came on the show and that you owned your nightclubs in, in South Florida <laughs> and South Florida is where I did a lot of my drinking and partying in Key West. Very um, sorry. My apologies <laughs> <laughs> for supporting you. <laughs> so um, I yeah, that, that was an interesting uh, connection. Um, I, I, I alcohol really was the solution for me. I, I before I ever discovered uh, alcohol or drugs, I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. A and that's just a really difficult way to experience life is not yeah. feeling comfortable in your own skin. And I, I, I always felt like I was behind a glass screen. And everyone was one side looking like they were getting on with everything just fine. And I was the other side. And I couldn't connect. And I, I discovered alcohol when I was about 15 and it just worked. It, it worked. It, I, I just felt like I fitted in my own skin. I felt confident. I could talk to boys and, and I was off. You know, I, I, um, I never look back alcohol and drugs, although alcohol really was my drug of choice. I, 
I wanted to be in that party scene. I thought that was life. You know, I thought that was life. I thought those people were having, like we're in the, the thick of it. And I wanted to be in the thick of it. And I had a really great time till I was about 18, which is barely the drinking, legal drinking age in the UK. And I hit um, a rock bottom. I was using hallucinogenic drugs and I went into drug induced psychosis. And um, mm. it was, I had a hot, that started sort of nine years of severe panic attacks, um, thoughts of suicide, anxiety, death, depression, desperately, desperately trying to cope. I mean, it was just such a horrible time. Um, I felt very lost and alone, but I was at the same time, very much trying to keep up the appearance that everything was okay. So I uh, got through college, I had jobs, I've never been fired from a job. So I was presenting like that I was all right, but inside I was completely, Humbling. yeah, the incongruence mm. of that, you know, the mm. incongruence of not, of feeling so desperate inside and presenting to the world that you were okay. And a lot of that was because I didn't even know how to articulate yeah. what was wrong with me or what was going on with me. Um, That's what I was, was going to say. That's what I was going to say. Mm. Like now you're finding the language to actually say how you were mm. feeling back then. But back in those days, you were just caught up in trying to get that feeling sustained, even though it was inducing alcohol or whatever. Yeah. And, and um, you know, it, it's a horrible feeling to go through the world so disconnected from yourself, let alone other people, but so disconnected from yourself. So I searched for answers. I thought I kind of knew I shouldn't do drugs. I never considered alcohol was a problem because everybody drank. And I thought that's what adults did. I didn't never occurred to me. It literally never occurred to me that you, you could not drink alcohol because I was very committed to the belief that alcohol was the best way to have fun and, and excitement and belonging and connection and to relax and to reward yourself. So why would you give that up, right? I mean, I just had to figure out how to manage it. Um, I used alcohol to cope with my anxiety a lot, which is very common, I then discovered. Oh, the one thing I discovered when I got sober was how utterly unoriginal I was. <laughs> I thought I was really special and different. And I thought I was the only one who felt the way that I did. I thought I was the only one struggling and the only one who had these problems. So I, I was personally very relieved when I discovered that actually I'm as common as anything and that there was a solution. So um, I desperately looked for help. I went to doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists and therapists and churches and anything that looked like it had some kind of answer. But I, I was never really, the drinking bit, it, it was always my mental health, the anxiety, the depression. I feel like, it's certainly in the UK, and I feel the USA is the same, there's this culture of, even thinking about not drinking is like a drastic, you know, it, it's like nobody talked to me about my drinking. It was all like trying to manage my mental health and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was actually, I would be in England for a couple of years and then I would burn my bridges and then I would go to Key West, Florida where I had friends and I'd do that for a bit. And it was the last time I was there in 2000 that I met someone who was sober. And that mm. was, that was sort of, and she just seemed really happy and comfortable in her own skin. And I was like, wow like that's like how bizarre <laughs> like that's a thing um and that was the beginning of my journey really oh. i think um in all honesty being in south florida cocaine is everywhere yeah and it brought me to my knees it just yeah. finished me off um yeah. i don't i think without that combination i could have drunk for another 10 years but it was alcohol and the combination of cocaine that just finished me off i i yeah. was des yeah. desperate you know, as much as you, as much as we are having a conversation about alcoholism and whatever, drug abuse and whatever, there are some of us who have not gone down that road and we're still disconnected with ourselves, mm. Veronica. Mm. And I don't necessarily often feel that if I happen to be using food as my drug of addiction, you know, my, mm. my, my choice of drug or a relationship 
or alcohol or cocaine or whatever, it's still the same. <laughs> I've met people who do none of that mm -hmm. and who are addicted to an interpretation in their heads that make no mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. And they're still disconnected from their from themselves, I think. Or this what, as well, the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the fact that we can even see what our addiction is, it's even easier than if we can't see that the mm. addiction or the issue mm. is really up here. But there was something that you said, and I think it was in the book, and you said you didn't have relationships in those days. You just basically were like capturing hostages, you know, thinking that you'd have been saved by love or something. What? What did you mean about that? So this is what I want to write about in my next book. It's that I believe that we are all searching for salvation. Mm. And I believe in our culture, we have been very convinced and prepped that the romantic relationship will be our salvation, the one. Mm. When we find the one, we will, you know, we will live in this fantasy world for the rest of our lives. And I believe our culture really feeds that and I know I was trapped in that cycle I was I get uncomfortable with my own skin lonely no self-esteem no confidence and I absolutely believed the right man would fix me would save me I was looking to be saved I wanted some I, what I was looking for was safety what I was looking for was roots because I, I I felt like I lived my life on quicksand mm. and I believed that if I had a boyfriend, the right man, then all of that would go away. Um, so when you, you know, when you're looking for a partner and you have no self-esteem and you're uncomfortable in your own skin, you don't like yourself very much. I, I wasn't really capable of a functioning, healthy relationship. So I just took hostages, <laughs> which is don't leave me, don't leave me, don't leave me, don't leave me, <laughs> which, you know, was just, <laughs> I mean, so dysfunctional. Um, and, and it was, I really, you know, and I would feel that when a relationship ended, the absolute black hole of despair. And of course, now I know as a psychotherapist, all that my original abandonment from my father and the family of origin and stuff, I was just recreating that over and over again. Um, but I think that that's such a, I think, I feel that's very universal that we place too high a burden on our romantic partners. And it's because this cultural belief we have about it and this need for salvation yeah there's two things that you said that i'm pulling from uh one was you felt that you were so alone you know that you were behind this glass this glass mm. wall only to realize that you weren't there were so many that were feeling mm. the same whether they were using a, a substance or they were just in their own heads in their own way and the second thing, who who have like, we've all looked for somebody to complete us because that was the way of the world, right? And in this particular generation that we're in, with everything breaking apart for us, we're realizing the relationship is really an intimate, um, paying attention to what are you thinking inside of your head and what are you feeling and where are you going with that thought right now? Mm -hmm. as you're in this relationship, or as you say hello to a new person that could possibly spend the rest of your life with you. And so this, this language, I've often said, you know, and this is no disrespect to a country that I love with all my heart with America, but to be born spiritually in America is tough because, mm -hmm. because all of the pieces aren't really there. You go to India, you go to Thailand, you go to Africa, there are just natural ways of living. Mm. You know, there's not this pumped up existence based on science and all of the paraphernalias that say you've got to be this in your, you know, Rolls Royce and limousine and Rolex. I was on Instagram yesterday and I forgot who the guy was, but he was showing his watch that was worth $7 million, the watch alone. And so you see that and you're impressed and you have a watch that costs $5.99 on Amazon. And then you start to feel like you're not valuable. You go, just, you know, give me a scotch on the rocks or something, you know, because you don't feel like your life is fulfilled. So I think sometimes we have these narratives that are really distracting us from the real underlying 
problem that we're really wanting to solve because you did say that drinking is simply a symptom of another problem mm. that is deeper within mm. so yours might have been what fear and panic attacks you know right so when you first made a decision to become sober that was huge for you yeah and, and what you're describing there i talk about this in my book is we get lost in the external world we live in two worlds we we, we have to operate in this external world but our home is the internal world. But we get lost in the checklist, right? If I have the right partner, I'm the right way, I look, a lot of it is about appearance. And then if I have the stuff and the prestige and the, and the station in life, if I check all of those off, then I have been told I'll be happy and safe. Also, I think it's not just happy, I think safe is another part of it. And, you know, I would get some of those things and I, for, I would feel those that that feeling of completion and happiness for about 30 seconds and then it would just it, it and and sobriety it, it's internal it's the internal work and dr um, i don't know if you're familiar with dr gabor mate's work he talks about trauma uh being the root i think you love him uh, uh being the root of all um addiction and um some people kind of struggle with that because i, I had a I, had a, I was raised as a single, in a single parent family with a mother who has mental health problems, so my emotional needs weren't met. I was loved, she did her best, but I, I didn't suffer, you know, lots of children suffer really awful trauma and you can see the link there to addiction. The way that um, Dr. Mate describes it is we have two basic needs as children. We have um, the attachment need, which we know about. We know we have to attach to our primary caregivers to uh, thrive. And we also have the need for authenticity. And, and what can often happen is as we grow, we realize that we have to suppress our authenticity in order to meet, get our attachment needs met by the people around us, particularly our family of origin. And that's what I did. I, it, it was just made very clear that parts of myself were very unacceptable. Um, you know, I come from a very classic British family where we just don't do feelings. And I had very <laughs> big feelings about everything. And it was communicated very clearly to me that that was not acceptable. So I had to push this stuff down. So sobriety is the journey back to oneself. It is the it is reclaiming yourself it is the journey to reclaim your authenticity because that was the that's why i drank i drank yeah. because i got lost in the external world and nothing fixed me yeah. and i drank because i wasn't my authentic self and and when any just as you described when any human being experiences that i think it's just very painful and we will of course look for an, an anesthetic of whatever yeah. works it's interesting because one of the things that I've experienced for myself on my path of spiritual practice, I love having an intimate relationship with my consciousness, which means no one can get in between what I'm feeling between a moment of silence and a moment of wisdom. And there's something that clicks at that time. Mm -hmm. And I think the moment of sobriety uh, or that really aha moment says, you've got you, you know, you've got you right now. Now, are there some misconceptions, some common, you know, myths about alcoholism and sobriety, including misconceptions that alcohol on its own is the problem? I think so. And a lot of people, we've got, kind of moved away from using the word alcoholic and, and alcoholism, you know, um, alcohol use disorder, that kind of stuff. I think that um, th that's the biggest thing I see is um, I see people who struggle Usually the research shows that people spend 10 years from the first day they wake up and think, I wonder if this is like, I should be drinking so much. I wonder if there's something wrong with my drinking. People spend 10 years trying to manage it because of the belief system of what it brings. Because not wanting to stop because of the belief system that if I stop drinking, I'll never have fun. I'll never belong. I'll never fit in. I'll never, you know, enjoy life. How will I reward and relax myself? Relax. So they spend 10 years and then eventually, you know, it usually becomes apparent that, that ab abstinence from alcohol is the only way. And then I think the misconception is, well, you know, okay, I'll just stop drinking and then everything will be fine. And what I find in my clients is 
when we struggle with alcohol or whatever it is, it takes up bandwidth. So it takes up 20, 30, 40% of our bandwidth. And by that, I mean energy and space to think thoughts. Because when we struggle with alcohol in that 10 years, what we're doing is we are thinking about drinking. We're thinking about not drinking. We're drinking and we're recovering from drinking. And those, that just takes bandwidth. Now you can do a lot with 20, 30% of your bandwidth being used up. You could, you could get, have a job and a career in a nice house and go on nice holidays. And on the outside look like everything's okay. But what I have found is you, what you can't do is emotionally grow. You can't emotionally grow because you're defaulting of to course. alcohol to, to manage your emotional life. Stressed at work, have a drink. Fight with your husband, have a drink. Um, close the deal, have a drink. So we're, we're not developing emotional skills that we need. So when, when people stop drinking, we're often emotional teenagers. I know I was, and, and I was so ill-equipped to deal with life. I didn't know how to deal with people because I just defaulted to alcohol for any uncomfortable feeling. I just, alcohol solved that. So I didn't have to work through any uncomfortable feelings or deal with disappointment or resentment or fear or frustration. And those are absolutely key skills that we need to have as a human being. So I think the one of the big misconceptions is all you need to do is just stop drinking and then everything will be Great. And, and I think sometimes people find it's they often feel worse for a short amount of time if they're just trying to do it on their own without any help. And, and that's what my work is, is um, the emotional sobriety part, the inner work, the developing those life changing skills, because that changed my life, being able to know how to have boundaries with people, know, mm. how, dealing with resentments, dealing with fear. All of those mm. things just made my life so much more easier to navigate. And then I never thought about drinking because I didn't, I wasn't uncomfortable in my own skin anymore. My brain wasn't looking mm. for the anesthetic. Sure, sure. You know, when you talk about the work that you're doing, your emotional sobriety work, could you share with us maybe one step, one thing that you offer? Somebody out there is watching this right now and they're mm -hmm. feeling it that one thing that you would recommend that they should start with to just kick them onto the journey? Of emotional sobriety. So mm -hmm. um, I think there's four key components to emotional sobriety. I think it's being able to have boundaries, balance your needs, deal with resentments and change your limiting beliefs. And, and for me and what I've seen in other people, it's actually the resentment work that has been so transformational because and, and resentments is you know when we're angry with someone or upset or whatever it is um and that rents space in our head and we feel victimized or hard done by or it's not fair or blah 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 and what i discovered i, I mean i just took everything personally i thought what you did and what you said i just interpreted it to to be about me so i would you know People just didn't do what, didn't respond the way I wanted or do what I wanted. So what was revealed to me in the resentment work is that nothing is personal, that nothing is about me. And that what, what you do, what you say, your responses, your reactions, they have nothing to do with me. That's about where you are, where you come from, what, what you're, what's going on in your day. And that, that, transformed me because it, it gave me freedom in my mind when I was able to begin to not take things personally. And, and you know, it's not that I don't want anyone to think that, you, you know, I walk around in this serene. I don't. I still get a resentment from time to time. But the difference is I have a tool now. I know I can recognize it. I know what it is. And I have a tool for it to be able to process through that. A lot of people don't consider themselves to be holding a lot of resentment. Mm. What are some of the signs that you actually are holding resentment? You know, I'm always suspicious when I have some people say, I don't get resentful. I'm like, mm -hmm. um, so I can tell you what the red flags are for me is um, I know I'm resentful when it rents space in my head and I start planning revenge. And that's just so normal, right? It's like, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of one I had recently. I don't know. I got an email. It was a couple of weeks ago. I got an email from someone that upset me and I just spent all day dwelling on it. 
And I, in my head, I was planning the email I was going to send back and I was going to show them and they were going to be sorry and they were going to realize I was right. And as soon as that happens, um, after a while, I'm like, oh, it's a resentment. And so that's just an unpleasant way to experience the world. And it also, it, it, it burns up energy unnecessary, unnecessarily. I mean, like I'm just going over in my head, you know, like, and, and, you know, blowing it all out of proportion. So I need a tool to be able to shift my perspective. So that's what happens is um, uh, when I get stuck in a resentment, I have a certain perspective. I think it's X, Y, and Z. And there's, there's a, I feel there's a seduction with resentments. I notice there's a seduction to the self-righteousness, the I, I'm right here, that the, sometimes I wanna dwell in. Even though I don't like it, I like it. It's, it's a very interesting paradox. But, but because I am now in a place in my life where I just live very comfortably, this, when I'm disquieted in this way, it comes to my attention fairly quickly and I want to be free of it. I just want to be free of it. I think uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer spoke about being free of the good and bad opinion of other people. Good one. You know, you've really um, put some clarity on the experience of resentment because even though in our show today we're talking about addiction and so on, we don't need alcohol or a drug to have us disconnected from ourselves. You know that. But have you noticed that in advertisement, uh, the way they condition drinking with genders, mm. men, it's like scotch, mm -hmm. whiskey, mm -hmm. and with women, it's like wine. Mm -hmm. You know, beer is universal. Mm. So do you think that there's like some cultural conditioning mm. going on for where women are concerned in how they drink or, mm. you know, how does it define them as drinkers? Mm. Does the question make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I think that absolutely. And I think that started in the early 90s, I think. Um, uh, and that's my generation, Generation X, where um, binge drinking was linked to feminism and, you know, shows like Sex in the City. Um, and all of this is misrepresented, you know, you don't, you, you, you on, on TV or in films, like there may be like a, an alcoholic storyline and that character has an alcohol problem, but everyone else is drinking their scotch or their wine and, and they're absolutely fine and there's no consequences shown, you know, it, it, you, they don't show what actually really happens. So I think that um, women have been very much targeted um, and in the 90s, we believed that, you know, it was a feminist act to drink like the boys. And, you know, there I am in these divey pubs thinking I'm like Carrie Bradshaw. Um, and now I've seen in the last few years, uh, uh, the, I mean, one of the things that bugs the hell out of me is uh, yoga and wine, yoga studios that do yoga and wine, never have two things not gone together. These are not two things that go together. I mean, it's crazy. I've never even heard that. Oh, yeah, it's a thing lots of yoga studios lots on a friday night yoga i've heard of the wine. goat yoga where you have a goat standing on you when you're doing yoga but i've never heard of yoga Ooh, and wine. never heard of a goat yet wow <laughs> <laughs> um but what the, the the trend that we're seeing at the moment is uh mommy drinks wine mommy needs wine mommy juice and um i think and, and that's really pushed that alongside also there's a lot of clean clean wine, clean organic wine. So it's implying that alcohol is a parenting aid and a health product. And it is neither of those things. And it's enormous, it's an enormous disservice to women. And I think there's actually a long history of um, anesthetizing women, you know, back to Valium and mother's little helper. I think that motherhood is extremely hard. And I think this promotion of alcohol as a way to bear it you know, it's like women are not going to, we need to be more angry. We need to pr protest more about what, you know, the help and support that mothers and women need, it's particularly in the USA. You talked about th this. I don't think there's, I think, uh, the, again, I love the USA. I'm an immigrant. He lives here and has American children, American husbands. I don't think that this culture is set up to support families and motherhood. I think it's, it's the opposite. It's such a massive burden. No wonder 
mothers are turning to alcohol. And we saw that shoot up dramatically in the last two years. So I think there is the strong associations with, uh, you know, whiskey and beer for men and, and yeah. wine and cocktails for, for, for women. Yeah. And it's, you know, um, the research is really uh, on the link between breast cancer and alcohol. It's really um, that there's some research that's come out recently that um, I'm hoping is going to get some more attention. But it's it's really the link to to breast cancer with women. It's like between 15 and 30 percent increases your chances on just two or three glasses of wine a week. And That's I don't think high. women. I don't think women realize that because I think I think a lot of people think two or three glasses a week is nothing. Like that's not even. That's but actually, high. that that's enough to significantly raise your chances of getting uh, breast cancer, and we've seen those rates go up. So, wow. um, yeah, I think that there's so much misleading marketing out there. Yeah, yeah, I get that. You know, uh, the other day I was listening to a friend of mine who was doing um, a live performance and he was saying, you know, I don't drink alcohol. I really don't like to touch it. I mean, I have an occasional glass of wine and he made it seem like wine was just like water. And in, in France, the French drink wine as if it is water. Mm. And I, I think it's interesting to see how each culture handles this particular area and, you know, anything in moderation, right, Veronica? Anything in moderation is fine. When you are no longer in control, then you have to really begin to pay attention to yourself. So look, let's celebrate you. It's been over 20 years. I mean, has life gotten boring for you or is it more <laughs> exciting than it's ever been? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I always tell people like, you know, if, if I got sober at 27, if it hadn't been fun, I'd have been drunk 21 years ago. Um, you know, the first year is different and difficult and challenging, and then it begins to settle down. But by year two, I was out going to nightclubs and dancing because I love dancing and to concerts and festivals and all the things. I was doing all the things and it never ceased to amaze me that um, how much I enjoyed myself and how much better it was sober. And I, it's all about perspective. You know, it's very interesting how our perspective changes. And I would, you know, f at the first year, I'd look at friends my age going out and partying with envy and think, oh my gosh, it's not fair. They're having such a great time. A few years down the road, I'd look at them and think, oh God, that looks awful. Like, that doesn't look fun at all. It doesn't look like, wow. And then you're like sick for three days. I'm actually going to Miami on Friday to a sober women's event that has about 500 women um, at a conference, you know, speakers, there's food, there's dancing. And I love, it's such a joyous, and I love seeing the newly sober women kind of leave that event with this confused expression where they're like, they, they just had so much fun. It was such a great experience. And it just smashes all of those belief systems they had about being sober and uh, drinking. So, um, I am 100% clear that everything I have in my life, my career, my family, how I feel about myself, everything is absolutely due to being sober and staying in gratitude. It just gets better. It gets better. Um, I was in Thailand recently and we had a film crew there. And a lot of the camera folks were young guys. They were in their 20s or their 30s. So there might have been about maybe 10 or 15 of us and none of us drank, none of us drank. It was water, I'm the only vegetarian in the group, but it was just water, my veggies, their stuff and water. But these young guys were like, is it okay if I can order a scotch or a beer or something? And I remember turning to one of the camera folks and I said, why don't you try to just enjoy what's actually happening? Just try it just once and just see if you can move into and, and, and feel what is happening, just being you. And the way he looked at me in such an amazement that he had never thought of that. Of course, the next day he ordered drinks, but he didn't order it that night. Mm. <laughs> you know, cause it's just the habit of saying, I'm out, I'm socializing, you know, bring me a bear, bring me a mm. scotch, bring me yes. something. Yeah. So listen, you know, thank you so much for making us more sober. And, you know, one has to say, Thanks for being on the journey that you've been on, or you so wouldn't have been here. And I'm sure your beautiful children are learning so much from you. So here you are now. What's next for Veronica? 
what's in her horizon? I'm manifesting a TV show. I want to, you can't tell people that alcohol's bad for them. You have to show people that al being alcohol free is nothing how they imagined. So I want to, uh, we're hopefully going to start filming in August, a proof of concept where we take people who are questioning their drinking, who are sober curious, who are kind of in that mm, kind of wondering place, but still very committed to the belief that alcohol is having fun and, and they would miss out if they stopped drinking. And we will take them on an alcohol free journey and we will shift their perspective. And at the end of it, they can just, they, the, everything that they believed and know will be, it'll, they can't unknow that. And then they can decide, mm -hmm. they, can, they can continue drinking, but they can't ever say that if they stopped drinking, they would be missing out or mm -hmm. that they, it would be boring and gray or any of those things. So I, I believe this, there's not a show out there like it. And I believe it's the show that the world needs. That again, I'm not against alcohol or people drinking but I push back hugely against the messaging of what yeah. it brings and that we, nobody talks about the consequences. And I push back hugely that sober equals boring, that, yeah. that I'm, I'm missing out. I'm not missing out on anything. So that's what's Absolutely. Next. Well, congratulations. And so it is the Tatsu. It has to happen. It has to happen. There's a program that I know a friend of ours worked on years ago they got so much funding from the network to do it. And it's called Booze Traveler. And so he travels around the world finding different forms of booze or different alcohol. And because it's feeding into that, they've gotten so much sponsorship and support. So now that there's so many non-alcoholic drinks mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. that's a great market. Mm -hmm. Why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's huge, isn't it? Yeah, Listen, is, yeah. I want to thank you so much for the work that you're doing and just thank you for joining me today. I've really enjoyed our time. I really did enjoy our time together. And congratulations for your courage. Keep thank going. Thank you, Sister Jenna. I've had a wonderful time too. It's been great. Leave us with a website that our viewers can contact you if they're interested to learn more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at soberful.com, or you can just put my name in, Veronica Valley. I'm on Instagram, and I have a Facebook group called Soberful as well. Okay, beautiful. I'll definitely follow you after the show. Thanks again. All right, everyone. Veronica Valley has left us with so many jewels to contemplate on. And if you happen to be going through some situations, situations where you're feeling like you're losing control of your sense of self, your authenticity, you're able to see the world with clear eyes. Maybe give her a call, see what can happen. Or maybe something that was shared today has shifted you. You know that's my intention, right? That after every normal, next normal that you view, something in you got better. Something in you got better. And if you become better, then the world becomes better. It's all so easy, isn't it? So just remember nobody, nobody has the power to take away your happiness unless you give them permission. So maybe if you look with your three eyes, you realize that maybe we're here to love each other the same. Thank you so much for joining us today and take very good care of yourself. Meditation, intimate experiences with the divine through contemplative practices. My new book that is out on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and you can get it from Sacred Stories Publishing or on America Meditating Radio. The quieter you become, the more you're able to hear. One of my opening pages of this book. I have heard time and time again that when you go into the stories and the narratives of the 37 authors that are sharing with you their mystical experiences of the divine, something in you changes. It has already reached number one three times in mysticism category and the new age category for new releases. I want you to get a copy for yourself and tell me what you feel as a result of closing that final page of this book. Meditation, intimate experiences with the divine through contemplative practices. It's calling you. Can you hear it?